Okay, so Rick, welcome back to Mea Culpa. There could not be a better time for me to be asking you to join. So thank you for that. And because Happy the hour goes you, by Michael. so quick, I just want to thank you, my brother. So let's just jump right into it. Obviously, the big news of the day is Kamala Harris's decision to pick Tim Walsh as yep. her vice presidential. What do you think motivated Kamala Harris to choose Tim Walsh as her vice presidential running mate? You know, Michael, I think she was looking for somebody who is going to be a lot like her, optimistic about the country, um, somebody who was going to be able to go into a, a fight against J.D. Vance as a happy warrior. And, and I think she was looking for somebody who is quick on his feet, who's good on TV, good on good on the air, smart about how to handle the idiotic attacks that are going to be flowing out of, of Trump world every second of the day. Um, and I think be, because of all that, this was a pretty smart pick on her part. I also think it was a smart pick because he's been a successful governor. He's from a key uh, part of the country, he's from a region that will help her, I think, pretty significantly. And I think he's got a background as a as a, a coach, a senior non-commissioned officer in the National Guard, um, as a governor, as a congressman, all of which I think add up to giving her a real boost in in the campaign, which, you know what, she's been she's been on rocket fuel the last few weeks. And I think this will just help it further. And I didn't think that that rocket fuel was going to stop. Let's let's be clear about something. Um, and I've heard a lot of commentators try to discuss it. But here's right. my take on it. She's been on this meteoric rise since the announcement that she was going to be running uh, as the for the presidency of the United States. OK. OK. Then on right. top of that, you have upcoming the DNC. I'm sorry. You have the vice presidential pick that is going to give another boost, as it always does, because yep. this is what is going to occupy media attention. Now, That's dissecting right. Tim Walls and as you just said, he's a very good choice. Okay, what comes next? You then have the August 18th um, hearing that's going to be about Trump and the election interference case yep. with Judge Chutkin. That's mm -hmm. another negative which Kamala Harris and her team are going to need in order to continue to keep the momentum on her and away right. from him. Negative to him, positive to her. But mm -hmm. then wait, there's more, right? <laughs> you then have at the end of August something I called you about because I'm having a fucking hard enough time getting one single ticket to the DNC convention in Chicago. That is a three-day event that is going to also completely revolve around who's speaking, what's going on there. It's going to, it's going to consume all of the media attention, very oh, yes. much like the Republican convention consumed the media for those three days with Hulk Hogan and Amber Rose and all of the other, you know, um, all the other geniuses there. But wait, I call them the more. mutant parade. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? But wait, there's even more. September 18th, you then have the sentencing hearing by Judge Juan Mershon yep. in the criminal case before Judge Juan Mershon here mm -hmm. in New York. So again, it's going to be all about Kamala Harris and now Tim Walls against felon and whatever the sentence is going to be, Donald Trump and weirdo J.D. Vance. So I think it takes you straight into October for this ongoing continuous yep. rise by Kamala Harris, your position. Look, I think he is going to have a really hard time changing the narrative. I think it's going to be a really hard time for Trump to get out of what we are seeing as the described um, position that he finds himself in. He is going to be sentenced. He is going to have more, more legal jeopardy. He is going to be more and more angry, more and more ratcheted up, more and more pissed off. And it, none of that is what Trump needs right now. He desperately needs normalcy and a long stretch of campaign time where he's fighting Harris on his own terms or about whatever he thinks is important, the economy or, or whatever it is. But he's not going to get that. And in part, he's not going to get that because he, he can't discipline himself. He has no discipline. He has no mental ability 
to stop being an asshole for five minutes and concentrate on victory. Um, you saw it in Georgia. He's attacking Brian Kemp, one of the most popular governors in the country, a governor in his own party. He's yeah. going hammer and tongs at this fucking guy because he can't stop himself. And, and the longer that runs on, the longer that goes, the longer Trump finds himself, you know, distracted by bright and shiny objects, the longer and further away it gets from a victorious campaign message against Kamala Harris. He has, he has slipped about, depending on the state, between seven and 11 points in most of these states. Some of those states he's stayed the same or come down and she's gone up. Some of those states he's gone down and she's gone up. But the net, when it comes down to it, is this map doesn't look anything like it did three weeks ago. He is in a deep hole. He knows it. You know this guy better than anybody that when he gets in a hole like this, he's going to try to start throwing bombs and doing crazy shit and trying to find any way out of it. I don't think there's a way out of it right now. Yeah, I don't either. So let me ask you this then. Let's keep just concentrating on uh, Tim Waltz. Yeah. So how do you think that his experience as a former governor and his policy positions, how do you see them complementing uh, Kamala Harris's platform? Well, look, he comes out of executive experience in a big state where he had to work with Republicans and Democrats to get things done, and he did. Um, he didn't seem to care if it was red or blue. He seemed to care if it worked. Getting kids school lunches uh, and school and, and free hot breakfast and school lunches is not a partisan issue for a guy like Waltz. Um, I think in terms of his positions and his policy, it's it, he's good. But I think what really wins for Waltz is that he comes across as a regular Midwestern guy. He doesn't mm -hmm. come across as a coastal elite, super liberal progressive. He comes across as a guy who knows how to change a tire. He comes across as a guy who knows how to how to you know do ice fishing. Fuck, I don't know how to do ice fishing, but um, he comes across as a normal guy, as a dad. You know his history in the military. He was an artillery officer in the National Guard. This is a guy who really has a lot of different um, affect and different presentation than the cliched democratic sort of idea that, oh, they're all liberal liberals mm -hmm. who went to Yale. And this guy went to state schools. You know, he is not a, he's not a fancy guy. He's not an over, he's not an overdone, over um, played guy. He's really a very interesting character in this, in this, in this contest. Right. So you think that that will have an impact on the key swing states the fact that I he think, is I this Waltz, sort of average I think Joe. Waltz, yeah, I think Waltz helps in, in Michigan. I think he helps in Wisconsin. I think he helps in Pennsylvania. And frighteningly for Trump, he may even help us in Ohio, um, which they thought with J.D. Vance, would, you know, Ohio is a pretty red state, but they thought if they had J.D. Vance on the ticket, Ohio would be in the bag all, automatically. And it doesn't look that way now. It looks a lot different now. So we're we're in a very interesting spot where I think this choice is going to really reformat the map, and it's going to really help uh, Harris make a case that she's looking at people who aren't just like you know every other you know uh, central casting Democrat from a East Coast metropolis. Interesting. So look, you know, there's so much to talk about in terms of Trump and J.D. Vance with the nonsense that they're spewing, the level of stupidity, the comments, the weirdo comments, which, of course, you know, Tim Walsh is the one who coined it. Yes. So it's funny. Tim and I now have something in common. So he <laughs> coined weirdo, and I actually coined von Schitzenpants, which made it into the public <laughs> record. And there's now articles that are being written about. I'll send it to you. They're funny as hell. You can check it out on my Twitter account. It. You know, where, you know, it's it's now it's a common phrase that if you mention the term von Schitzenpants, yes. everybody knows that you're talking about Donald. But more importantly, these MAGA maniacs are going to rallies wearing diapers now and said, I'd rather wear a diaper than vote for a Democrat. How it, crazy it is, is it, that? It really has. It really has reached a point, Michael, where they're almost beyond parody. You, you almost you you listen to this you listen to this garbage and it's almost like are you people fucking serious who you are are you seriously 
wanting America to take you as legitimate possible leaders of this country when you act like this degree of asshole? Because it's crazy talk. I mean, it's so really let's, go, go, let's, go, let's jump into some of the so let's jump sure. into some of the crazy talk. So Trump the other day calls Kamala Harris a catastrophe, a catastrophe for the upcoming Olympics. So <laughs> my question to you is one: I know that he's got the magic eight ball. Someone bought that for him as a gift years ago. So right. is Kamala Harris a catastrophe for the Olympics? I don't know. We just crossed 3,000 Olympic says, medals in our says, history. It, it seems like we're doing okay, honestly. It says, shake, it's, it says try again. So now he <laughs> shakes again, and it says yes. So he now calls her a catastrophe. How do you interpret these comments in the context of his broader strategy against her? I th See, Michael, I think that's part of this. I don't think Trump has a broader strategy. I think he mm -hmm. planned to run against Joe Biden. It was all going to be like, Joe Biden's too old, too old, too old. And the whole thing fell apart when Biden said, I'm out. And and, and I think Trump didn't have a plan B. I don't think he had a, another approach in mind. So now he's doing all the usual Trumpy bullshit. I'm going to, he's going to do name calling and he's going to do, you know, the, she's a liberal, 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 liberal. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have any, he doesn't really have another way to go at her that makes a lot of sense for anybody. And there's a reason for that is because it's mostly just him being insane. He's not sensible. He's not, he's not thinking this through. He's not, he's not planning something. This isn't like 15 dimensional chess. This is Trump like eating the pieces and licking the board. It's just, it, it, it's chaos more than anything else. So do you think that this sort of messaging resonates at all with his base? Or do you think that his base thinks it's as stupid as shit? Look, here's the beautiful thing about the Olympics. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference if you're black, you're white, you're brown. Nope. It doesn't nope. make a difference what your religious conviction is. If you are American, you are rooting for America to win the gold. And if they that's can't exactly win the gold, you want you, them to meddle. That's exactly what every, every American under the sun has always felt. This That the Olympics were a way for people to come together and show their support for their country. It didn't matter if the athletes were Republicans or Democrats, black or white, you know, men or women, young or old. It mattered that we were going to come together as a country. And I think, Michael, it speaks to something really deeper about Trump, too. This guy has a really shitty view of America. He's a really yep. pessimistic view of America. He's a really like, like he th he's always saying things like, "Oh, we're idiots. We make bad deals. This country's stupid," you know. And it's and it's always an insult. It's always some like Trump style like like uh, tearing down of America. And I think that is something that people just. I think there's a. I think there was a sell by date on it. And I think the fact that he's out every day, like bitching and moaning about his fake stolen election, it's boring now. Trump has become, he's dangerous, but he's now also boring. And people don't like it. They're just tired of it. They're just, they're just like, okay, that's great. That's a great show, Donald. And look, the, the Republican rallies are getting smaller and smaller and they're less and less um, like, you know, 20,000 person arenas. And frankly, more and more, a couple of hundred yahoos who show up to sell T-shirts. And well, let me you know. ask you this. Let me let me ask you this then. Do you think that the Harris campaign should respond to these sort of criticisms, or do you think that they just ignore it and allow him to continue to stick his peppermint flavored shoe right in his mouth? I think I think you let Trump be Trump. I mean, that's what Republicans used to always say. But now it's actually if you let Trump be Trump, he'll lose this election by record numbers because he is a fucking idiot, Michael. He is not gifted politically. He is lucky. He has the luck of the devil. But this guy is out of touch with what America is now. He is shitting on on the Olympics. He's shitting on uh, getting our hostages back. Uh, J.D. Vance is shitting on single women. Uh, you know, they're, they're, all these things that they're doing, they play to a very small and getting smaller part of the MAGA base. So this country is in a is in a different spot than it was in 2020, 
and a really different spot than it was in 2016, partly because we know who the fuck this guy is now. He's not fooling anybody anymore. We know who he is. And so there's not going to be, um, there's not going to be a, 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 a groundswell of people who are like, you know, I really want somebody who makes me feel worse about America. I want somebody who makes me feel shitty about my country. And that's what Trump does. He makes people feel shitty about America. And I think that is, like I said, I think that is like way in the rearview mirror now for our country. I totally agree with you. Hey, I wanted to ask you this because obviously everybody in their mothers were calling me, asking me, who do you think that she's going to pick? Who do you think she's going to pick? To be honest with you, I was I would have gone with Mark Kelly one. I would have gone with Bashir two. Mm. I would have gone with Josh Shapiro three. And I would have gone with Tim Walsh as number four. That was my pick. So I clearly was incorrect about that. So the question I want to ask you, being the political guru that you are, why do you think that she opted for Tim Walsh over people like Josh Shapiro, Mark Kelly, or Bashir? What was it about him? Well, I I think there was something about him that worked in the equation on the Midwest that she felt was had benefits across multiple domains. It helped that he is a guy who is um, personable and smart and and able to communicate well. It helped that he was somebody who uh, you were never going to find that he was frightening to people. Look, there were every the, the embarrassment of riches she had people to choose from are all people I know and like. I mean, Mark Kelly, terrific resume. Andy Bashir, love him to death. Uh, Josh Shapiro, one of the best governors in the country. There's a, this long list, um, but it also speaks to the fact that she's made a leadership decision on how she wants to um, how she wants to, to to run for president. I think that's great. I think it's amazing that she's made a made a call like this. And it, and it it is something that is um, that is the process is as it tells you a lot about her thinking, and the process was secret. Nobody leaked. It was quiet. People understood who, what the rules were. Um, it was considered. She looked at them carefully. She had actual vetting of them, which was not something Trump did with Vance. They accepted. I was told by a, a Trump admin or a Trump campaign source that they just took the opposition research file from the campaign in 2022 and and he said okay he's been cleared um and so you know you've got a guy who who brings her a lot of benefits and she made a smart decision about it in my view well then let me ask you this do you think that if she had chosen somebody like shapiro or mark kelly that there would be any sort of alteration in the dynamic of the Harris campaign? Or do you think it just, it would have been something similar? He's just better. He checks more boxes. I mean, a lot of people were hoping that it was going to be Shapiro, who happens to be a great orator, and he's very quick and witty on his feet. Not to mention, Pennsylvania is such an important state. Well, I think I think a lot of this is going to come down to um, an understanding of what the campaign needed in this moment, and 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 the campaign needed a the campaign needed a um, somebody who could help them in the Midwest, who could help them in in uh, as a contrast to JD Vance, could help them with middle class voters because Walt scans as a regular middle class guy. Um, could help them with folks who do not see, um, who do not maybe see some of the others as as close to their experience in their lives as walls might be. And I, but I think, it, look, I think I think there were again there were a bunch of great options. He just happened to be the one that fit right. Makes listen makes perfect sense. And again, I'm just trying to tr- figure out the process that the Harris campaign undertook in order to make this decision. Because like like uh, Walsh, I believe that Shapiro and Kelly and Bashir possess certain qualities that could have also sure. been both advantageous 
as well as disadvantageous to yeah. Look, I, I think uh, Michael. I think I think that's a good point, and I, I think one thing to, to one way to sort of frame it, I think mentally, is to um, I think Shapiro would have helped in Pennsylvania. I think I think Kelly would have helped in Arizona. Bashir, we're not going to win Kentucky, so let's just leave that on the table. Um, but I think Waltz is culturally mm-hmm. a lot more helpful in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Ohio than any of the rest could have been at, to connect culturally. I think he was really the best choice. Okay. So when we, it's very funny that you use those terms. He's the right, the best choice. We can't forget the fact that this election is going to be about a prosecutor versus a felon. And I'm blown away that we are, as the United States of America, the beacon on the hill of democracy, world superpower, I spoke to cousin, my cousin the other day. He was from Toronto, Canada. Right. And he turns around and he says to me, I, I'm so speechless. The fact that Trump, who is now a twice impeached, mm-hmm. four times indicted, sexual assault, or business. This summer has been a scorcher. I mean, I enjoy walking Central Park. And after I do my four miles, I got to be honest, my underwear feels like I just came out of the pool. But now I wear my Tommy John underwear. Let me be clear about this. Tommy John makes me feel fresher, cooler, stylish, drier, and more comfortable overall than other brands of underwear, especially, especially in warm summer temperature. Lightweight, meshy, breathable, cooling fabrics. I mean, you know what that equals. It equals no sweat. Tommy John underwear, it's soft and it's comfortable and they don't ride up on you and they keep you really cool, which is the important thing when you're talking about the oppressive heat wave that we're living through. So not like many of the other brands that I used to wear, Tommy John is different. It's different from the other underwear that I just don't buy anymore. And Tommy John fabrics, they keep you two to three times cooler and they dry, get a load of this four to five times faster than regular cotton underwear, which is perfect for your summer travel. So shop Tommy John right now for huge summer savings and get 25% off your first order at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. Save 25% at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Shop Tommy John right now for these huge savings. It's 25% off your first order at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. See site for details. Fraudster Mm -hmm. convicted 34 times in a criminal proceeding, owes the the state of New York $500 million, owes for a defamation and a sexual assault claim, meaning E. Jean Carroll, about $93 million. The guy owes $600 million yeah. in civil penalties. How this That's guy money. could be a representative, <laughs> you think? How this guy could be the nominee for one of your two political parties. And I say, I got to be honest with you, I don't know either. So that being the intro to my question, we now have, as I brought up before, August 16th, he went and he tried to get Missouri to go ahead and to file this action with the Supreme Court in order to block the federal election interference case, to which the Supreme Court gave him the two middle fingers, as we (laughs) like to do on political beatdown, right? Gave him the two middle fingers. So my question to you, is how significant do you think that the August 16th hearing will shape any public perception of Trump's alleged election interference? And when I say shape the public perception, I'm not talking about Democrats. I'm talking about Republicans, MAGA, and the independent voter. Here's the thing. For Republican base voters... For Trump's MAGA base, doesn't make any difference. 
For the millions of Republicans who voted for Nikki Haley, it makes a difference. For the millions of independents who voted um, against Trump in 2020, it makes a difference. Um, Trump's criminal behavior, everyone's like, oh, it doesn't make any difference. We are seeing it in our polling. It actually has made a difference. It's not with MAGAs. It's not changing their minds. But it is with Republicans who, who they, they've held their nose for so long um, on, this, on this more moderate Republican type voter, the Lincoln Project style Republicans. They've held their nose for so long. They're so sick of it. They're so exhausted by his bullshit. And this is like, this is a moment where a lot of them are like, okay, enough. Enough, enough, enough. He has embarrassed us long enough in this country. He's hurt us long enough in this country. And 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 we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna put up with this anymore. And to a great degree, that shouldn't surprise anybody that he's exhausting because he's exhausting. Um, and, and it shouldn't surprise people that there's a, a feeling of of Donald Trump was this figure who controlled so much in our politics for so long that he no longer has that that voodoo. He no longer has that power. He no longer has that ability to force people to do the things, you know, that he wanted. There are a lot of Republicans now who are like, oh my God, this fucking guy. And they're really unhappy. They're really unhappy about how much he's put them through. They don't like it, Michael. They're just tired of it. And and I get it. I I get it. And and look, they don't want to say, you know, they don't want to say that they hate him even though a lot of them do. They don't want to bitch about, you know, whether or not he should be president or not. They know he's going to be the nominee of the Republican Party. But they they are looking at Harris and Walls, and Walls and Harris are giving them reasons to not have to vote for Trump, to not be stuck voting for Trump, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Look, you know, the next question I really want to ask you is, and it pisses me off. I mean, when I tell you it fucking drives me crazy, yeah, but we don't know the outcome of what that hearing is going to be. We don't know the outcome. This is the one that really drives me crazy. We don't know the outcome that Judge Juan Mershon is going to come up with, what the sentence is going to be. And I say to them, what the fuck's the difference? He's found guilty by a right. jury He's been found guilty. He's already a felon. Right. Okay. okay. He's so a felon. Question. He's a fucking felon. He's never going to not be a felon in this in this well, process with this judge. And look, do I think the judge is going to like send Trump to to hard labor? No, I don't think that at all. I just don't. I don't. I don't buy it. But I don't think Trump's going to get off here with with some sort of easy like skate. I don't think he's going to walk away from any sort of accountability. They're going to hold the guy accountable. They're going to make him. They're going to make him face up to the shit that he has done so and, and what do you what do you what do you suspect that the uh what you call it what do you suspect that the sentence will be then look i think he's going to end up with uh some sort of fee and and some sort of supervised release house arrest whatever they may they may they may make him wear a gps bracelet on his our ankle ankle gps thing i don't know I don't know. I'm not. I'm not smart enough about that stuff to understand what the sentencing guidelines look like, or or should or sentencing or should do guideline is up to seventy years in prison, if not. Well, more. yeah, and I'm curious. That was another thing I was going to ask, though. I'm kind of curious, like, what does a guy like Trump end up doing if he does get a prison sentence? I mean, I think there'll be riots in the streets. Um, I, well, but why do you say that? See, that's another thing I hear from people. Oh, you know, MAGA base will never put up with it. Let me tell you something. The MAGA base is already looking to see their compadres that are sitting and rotting in jail like Stuart Rhodes for 18 years. They ain't doing shit. And the second that they decide that they want to start, believe me, our National Guard, our military, our police force, you know, our... They're, yeah, they're, 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 listen, this Michael, I do agree with that. I do agree street. with that. There's, you know? there's a real, there's a real degree of, of, um, of, of, of 
caution that has been injected into the most violent element of their of their movement. But I also think that 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 they're being stoked and pushed along and encouraged by a lot of you know by by the Fox universe and others to keep the you know this this idea that Trump is some sort of sacred figure or some sort of sacred leader um, alive and well for them. And Look, so this, I, this is, I would well, not write sorry, off Rick. the possibility yeah. of bad shit happening. Okay, but bad shit happens every single day. And the more that these idiots think, they'll get put down, one, two, three. I have faith in our, in our law enforcement. They're not going to get caught off guard. It's the same reason I, why I, I heard I the same not. story in 2020. Oh, if Trump loses, there's going to be blood in the street. There wasn't a sing, There wasn't even a paper cut. But my question really to you is more about the August 16th hearing. I mean, what outcome from the hearing do you think could have the most substantial impact on well, look, if the Trump 2024 prison, election landscape? If he sends Trump to prison... No, no, this is August 16th. Hearing. Oh, oh, I'm this sorry, we're about the election. Oh, yeah, yeah, look, once again, you're going to remind people of something that they really find very uncomfortable, and that is that Donald Trump tried to overthrow the United States government. And Donald Trump tried to, to overthrow a free and fair election. People do not like it. They are not comfortable with it. It has caused Trump a lot of harm politically that he can't let that shit go. It has caused him a lot of harm politically that he said things like he's going to pardon all the January 6th attackers. Um, those things have not helped Trump. Those things have not been, have not been good for Trump. That idea that, that, you know, that he was justified in doing what he did on January 6th and that, and, and, and right. And, and justified in engaging in a broad conspiracy to overturn the election. That's not a great look for him. It's a really <laughs> bad look. Not. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then. So how do you see this case affecting Trump's campaign strategy um, as well as his voter base? Do you think it well, has any look, effect? I think because he's a whiny titty baby, he's going to bitch and moan about it. And, and, and a lot of the media on the MAGA world will sort of like say, oh, my God, you're right. Mr. Trump is being persecuted by these, by these deep state judges, blah, blah, blah. It's all bullshit. It doesn't. I don't think it moves the numbers for him anymore. I don't think anybody. I don't think even inside the Republican Party, the elected Republican Party, there is a sense of we could be rid of this fucking guy in three months, um, which they would love, Michael. They would love that. That would make them. They would. They would. They would wake up every day and say, "This. Um, this is you know not a bad outcome." There are a lot of Republicans who really like to be rid of him. Most of the rank and file and the base are not those people, but but most of the elected Republicans in the country and the professional sort of Republican operatives and operators, they would love to be rid of this fucking guy. And what do you think is the likelihood, you know, that these folks are going to, you know, actually turn away from him? As a direct result of, you know, it's this a, case. Well, it's let me a ask great you this. question. Yeah, it's a great question, Michael. And I and I think, I, I, look, I don't think publicly you're going to get a lot of them that are going to be honest with you. Um, publicly, you're going to get a lot of them who straight out lie to your fucking face. I love right. Donald Trump. He's the most amazing thing since prepared mustard. Everything about Donald Trump is perfect. They are saying that out of political preservation and political protection of their own lives and their own futures. But honestly, a lot of them would be so relieved to be rid of them. They would, they would. And what do you think? Sure. But Rick, what do you think then is the chance that this federal election interference case gets tried before November, before the election? Look, I, I don't think it's going to make it to the election. Uh, I would like it to. I'd be hopeful that it would be. It'd be great if it was, but I don't think it's going to make it to the election. Um, I just think the legal maneuvering there, they'll be able to undertake um, will make it impossible to get to the to get to a trial and a verdict but before the election. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. So let me go to the next one that we were talking about. 
September 18th is legitimately almost 30, what is it, 40 days away from now. 40, yeah. On September 18th, Donald Trump is scheduled to be sentenced by Judge Juan Marchand in yep. the 34 guilty conviction district attorney of New York criminal case. So my question then to you is, the August 16th, right, the hearing, it's just that. It's a hearing, all right? And I'm with you. I don't see that ever making its way to trial before November. But this specific sentencing, this will seal the fact, the undeniable fact that Donald J. Trump is a fucking convicted felon. Yep. And on top of that, it is going to place some sort of uh, some sort of consequence on or accountability to his actions. Yeah, so, I think that I, I think I think it is one more thing where it's harder these days for Trump to assert and have people believe it that he did nothing wrong. This is all a conspiracy against him. People are not buying that in the way that they would have even a year ago. They're just not. Do some people still buy it? Yes. You know what? But some people still think Elvis is alive, too. Right. And so is John F. Kennedy Jr. But the well, question yeah. that I really <laughs> want to ask you is, how do you see? You see, I remember watching a slew of Republicans sitting in a focus group. And mm -hmm. the question that was asked of them, could you ever see yourself voting for Donald Trump if he becomes a felon? Now, a lot of the folks that were in that focus group do not believe that you are a convicted felon until the accountability or the sentence consequence right. occurs. So right. once this comes out by Judge Juan Marchand, you see this playing out with voters in any way? And let me ask you this. Let me add to it. What if Juan Marchand, Judge Marchand, actually orders incarceration? Or some form of a very strict, this is what I think will happen. It will right. be a very strict home confinement situation. How does that I affect suspect, the campaign Michael, that's, the race? That to me seems to me to be, that seems to me to be the most likely outcome is that he will say, um, Donnie, you're going to jail in your own house. You can't travel. You got a GPS bracelet. And, and pick and choose. Pick and choose only one home. You're not getting right. to start flying around the country. Right. You the can't world, go to Bedminster, then Mar-a-Lago, then New York right. City. No. Um, and, and look, I think there will be a lot of Republicans who think that that is a great thing for Trump. They'll say, oh, he's a martyr. He's this, he's that. But Trump's power to go out and get in the media and cause, and, and cause trouble in part is because he's willing to go places and do shit. Um, you know, and and if I were Judge Mershon, I would say one more thing to him, and uh, and it would be this: you will not enter or uh, you will not enter or use any of your golf courses while you are uh, under this confinement. Just as a as a fuck you to Donald. Nobody else wow. who goes to jail gets to play golf. So, <laughs> well, that's that, by the way, that's very very true. You know. I, one of the things that I was talking to you about earlier on is sort of like this um, nonsensical bullshit, uh, these attacks upon Kamala Harris, the comments that are being made by both J.D. Vance and Trump. There was one that just came out by Trump. And to this day, I just can't figure out. I cannot figure out anymore what's wrong with the hamster on the wheel inside of Trump's head because it just doesn't make any sense. Donald Trump went so far as to question Kamala Harris's black identity. I mean, <laughs> it, this to me made no sense. And it's not the first time he's attempting to question her black identity. Well, Michael, damaging. This, goes back, this goes back to Trump going after Barack Obama's birth certificate. And, and that is exactly what we're seeing here. It is a desperate move by a by a guy who's losing the race to try to get the subject onto onto her racial background and her her personal you know DNA whatever. And 
to her credit, her reaction so far has been like, who the fuck cares? Get the fuck out of here. You know, mm-hmm. it, it has not been this sense of like, like hair tearing outrage. It's been more like laughing the guy off, which he deserves. He, you know, the guy is a, he's a clownish figure acting as a clownish figure. And even though the clownishness right now is also chock full of racism, um, she's correctly identified that you don't need to just play into his hands here. You don't need to play his game here. You can be, you can have a sort of sense of like, all right, crazy man, keep, you know, old man yells at cloud, as they say. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, do you think that he was doing it because he's trying to sort of play up the race card? There, there, there's oh, yeah. always oh, 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 a yeah. reason. Well, look, the, the thing Donald Trump hates more than anything is uh, she's his kryptonite, okay? She has three things he fucking hates. She's black, she's a woman, and she's a prosecutor. All those things are like they're like fury bait for Trump. He can't and smarter sleep. than and smarter than him. Oh, and who laugh at his face? Yeah, all of those things add up. I think in a way that really Donald Trump is not equipped to handle. He is not ready to handle this race. And look. The thought of losing this race to a black woman is eating him alive. It is eating him alive. And and he has played careful racial politics with his people for so long, um, trying to trying to make them feel like um trying to feel make them feel like he's this representative of their white grievance. That it really is, it it really is making him feel very nervous that suddenly she's looking so effortless at kicking his ass and looking so much like a happy warrior at kicking his ass. It it's really, I think, eating him alive right now. Oh, good. Well, I mean, look, it, nothing stops him. I think he realized that he made a big mistake when he attacked Barack Obama on birtherism, he wasn't attacking the fact that Barack Obama is a black man. He was attacking him on his nationality, where he was born, trying to claim that he shouldn't even be allowed to run uh, because he wasn't born in the United States of America. Here, he's actually attacking Kamala Harris's skin color, her identity, and with some of the most disgusting posts that you could imagine. He posts a photo of her with her family, and he says, well, she's not black. She's identified as an Indian. And then they post her birth certificate. I mean, I just don't see this as being an effective strategy. Like Michael, it's it's so far from being an effective strategy that I know for a fact that Chris LaCivita and Susie Wiles, who are running Trump's campaign, have been begging him not to do it anymore, begging him. And he is, and in response, what is Trump doing? He's now asking other people like, oh, are they doing a good job for me? Should I keep them? Because I don't know if they like me anymore. I don't know if I like Susie and Chris anymore. And and of course they're doing, he's doing that because they disagreed with him on something. This is, they, they should know by now how this shit goes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, look, you know, if, someone's sitting on a train track and you know that, you know, the train is coming in five minutes. I guess the right move is to try to get him off the train track, which is what they're <laughs> trying to do. I have no regard right. for either of them, you know, for La Savita no. or for uh, Susie Wiles. But nevertheless, I can understand trying to pull him off the train tracks before he gets run over. So what does Donald then do? He then switches to another issue And he takes what's going on currently. And that's right now the correction in the stock market. He goes so far as to create a label for the recent stock market decline. And he's now referring it to as the Kamala crash. All right. How fair do you think it is to attribute economic trends to a single political figure, and especially (laughs) one who's merely the vice president who is going to be running or is running right now for the presidency. And there is no correlation between. You know, Michael, look, here's, here's the thing about that particular story. This is a guy 
who for months has been saying, oh, the market is up because they think I'm coming back. Right. And 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 it is, you know, correlation and causation are 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 not not the same thing. He likes to think they are. But but the big picture here is that Donald Trump um, is is a guy who does not have an economic plan, does not have a forward look other than this like ridiculous idea we're going to have 100 percent tariffs. Um, And so I think you've got a guy who's very much flailing around for any kind of issue to grab onto. Now, I don't know about as of right now when we're recording this, but earlier today, the market had rallied already. So I'd like to hear more about the uh, triumphant Kamala uh, boom, uh, if that's the case, because this is, the, look, logic and Donald Trump don't often go hand in hand, and they don't in this case either. So I think I think it's just, um, it's kind of silly on the one hand, um, but, you know, Trump's kind of a clownish figure now. Yeah, well, that's certainly for sure. I want to just bring something also to your attention and to the attention of my listeners, because one of the concerns that I have heard from people is that voter sentiment is influenced, particularly in swing states, based upon the stock market's performance. It has an effect, um, but here's the thing. It, the effect isn't as strong as most people think in the polling. Um, I mean, and 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 I, it's funny. It's funny you bring this up because my son is a pollster, and he and I were talking this morning, and he's like, he's like, it's a little bit disconnected now from where it used to be back in maybe twenty years ago, because you know a lot of people don't don't look at they they look at the stock market as something that benefits you know the hedge fund bros. Um, and it's not the same level of of engagement mentally and politically as it used to be. They are much more concerned, and this is a legitimate problem that, that, that Vice President Harris has to wrangle and tackle. They are right now much more concerned about inflation and gas prices still. Those things are still affecting Americans. Um, Trump's been very good at blaming Joe Biden for those things, unfairly, but very good at it. Um, and a lot of people still don't, they feel like their daily lives are tougher because um, of these, uh, of the of the costs of living um, in, uh, in terms of both housing affordability, um, gas, food, um, all those things that, that while the president, while, while President Biden or President Harris or even President Trump doesn't really get a big vote on how those things go, People do attribute them more these days to the president than not. Okay. However, and again, these are the sort of things I would like to see the DNC do, though they're just, they're not the Lincoln Project. Let me put it to you that way. (laughs) So I have 25 different dates of the, the greatest losses in the stock market based upon the amount in U.S. history. The first one, I'm only going to do 10 because I can spend the next 15 minutes talking about it. The first one and the highest amount ever lost was $2,997.10 on March 16th of 2020 under the Trump administration. Yep. The second most was 2500 I'm sorry, $2,352.06 on March 12th of 2020 under uh-huh. Von Schitzen Pants. Right after that, $2,013.76, only days before March 9th of 2020. How about $1,861.82 June 11th of 2020? Yep, you're right under Von Schitz and Pants again. Then you have $1,464.94 March 11th of 2020 under Donald. You then have March 18th of 2020, $1,338.46. What comes after that? $1,190.95 February 27th of 2020, under Donald. I mean, talk this is crazy. $1,175.21 two weeks before that, February 5th of 2018. 
All right. I'm sorry. The 22 years before that. Then $1,032.89 February 8th of 2018. And then $1,031.61 on February 24th back to 2020. I mean, I can go on and on and on. He leads the greatest, the greatest dollar decline in the stock yes. market's history. Yes. And nobody's talking about it. Michael, look, this is a this is a real disconnect in the media. And a lot of them um, still want this to be a horse race, still want this to be a race where they where they go back to having the kind of fun that they had in 2020 or 2016, where they go back into the world that that we used to live in. They really want that. They desperately, desperately fucking want that. And I'm sorry. Um, you know, I'm glad we live in a different world now. I'm glad we don't have the same degree of Donald Trump, you know, having that superpower over our politics anymore. But we still have to fight it out. It's still going to be a tough race. And, and there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of leeway in the in the in this. We, don't, we still can't make a lot of mistakes. Let's put it that way. This is going to be a tough campaign all the way down. And we still can't make a lot of big mistakes as as we face off against a guy who, who as clownish as he is, as much of a fuck up as he can be, still controls a formidable political machine. Yeah, that is so true. So then, you know, one of the things I always, every time that I have you on, and I'm honored to have you on and to come on your podcast and your show. Yeah, come on, come on, LP podcast. I'll, I'll send you an yeah. invite. Okay, I'm doing it next week. So here's my question to you, because, you know, I'm always complimentary of Lincoln Project and the work that you do. So the question I, I really want to ask you is, how do you see Lincoln Project's role evolving as the 2024 election approaches, especially now that you have Harris um, Walsh sure. as a ticket? Well, you know, Michael, we are focused and have been focused for a long time on um, the swing states, on Arizona. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Those were our four swing states that we were going to really lock in on. We have now expanded that map to Georgia, North Carolina, and Nevada. So we're adding some more swing states into this mix. And we're doing that because the opportunity is increasing in all those places. We see a better chance to persuade more of those Republican voters. Um, and, and those Republican voters, like the like the 22% of Republicans who voted for Nikki Haley in this year's primary, um, to persuade those people to bring them across, to contact the folks in what we call the Bannon line of those mm -hmm. moderate Republicans, more affluent, educated Republicans out in the country. We persuaded them under the program we built um, with my buddy Mike Madrid back in 2020. We persuaded them uh, in the statewide races in 2022. 20, uh, and we're going to persuade those folks again that we're not asking these people to become progressives. We're not asking them to become liberals. We're asking them to cast a single critical vote to get rid of Donald Trump once and for all. And we think it's going to work. Yeah, and by the way, it should. So let me follow up and ask you this. One of the big problems that I always find is whether it's the DNC under Jamie Harrison or even the Harris campaign, I just don't believe that their ad abilities, and I'm not talking about the paid ads that you see on television. I right. think it's I think the usage of social media, which basically is for free, you go to yep. the people like a Taylor Swift, you go to people like you know Beyonce, Queen B, right. you go to people like Lincoln Project or Michael Cohen with my three million followers out there in total, and then you just keep reposting the same ad so that everybody sees it on TikTok and, and YouTube and on uh, X and, you know, even on Trump's own social media platform. So the question I really want to ask you is how do you, how can Harris's campaign and her team leverage Lincoln Project's resources and your expertise to counter the misinformation and the volume of fucking lies and attacks that the Trump campaign and these bullshit bot farms keep putting out on a daily basis. Well, Michael, I will say this. We can't coordinate with the campaign legally because we're a super PAC and they're uh, the campaign. But that's fine. We're pretty good at what we're doing. 
We know what we're after. We know how to wage this war. We do four things really well at the Lincoln Project. We persuade those voters in the Bannon line, those soft Republicans. We move those people over to vote for either Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. In 2020, they moved to Joe Biden. We'll move them to Harris in 2024. Um, we are good at setting the narrative and showing Democrats how to fight, showing them how to get in the battle, showing them how to like wage this war uh, the way that Republicans do, which is an effective way to win. We want to show them how to fight. You know, that whole when, when they go low, we go high bullshit. That's over. Yeah. We're the guys in the basement with the chainsaw. And the final thing we do better than anybody is fuck with Trump because Trump's ego is tiny, his, his, his or delicate. He gets hurt. He gets distracted. We're very good at fucking with Donald, making him do stupid shit, making him run off the cliff, making him say and do things that no rational candidate would ever think to do. And, and the fact of the matter is we do that because I understand Trump. Our team understands Trump. We understand how to get ahead of his bullshit in social media. We understand how to make them stop their attack going in the right direction. Like the other day, Trump tweeted about the Lincoln Project. Oh, he called us the, the failed and disgraced the perverts at the Lincoln Project. So I responded on Truth Social to Trump. I said, failed and, fail, failed and discredited. Isn't that what Melania calls your penis? And so the fucking Trumpers wow. lost their minds. And I'm yep. like, see, now they've taken the bait. Now they're not talking about our advertising. Now they're just fucking in a goat rope. Now they're losing their shit. And we make him do that in a way that uh, nobody else really does. We get to him in ways that nobody else really does. And it, it, I, would, I would not have said this 20 years ago, but trolling is now a real significant part of campaigning. And there's nobody that trolls like we do. Nobody. It just doesn't exist. <laughs> I think, I, yeah, I think, I, I, true, yeah, I, true. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put it. myself. <laughs> I'm going to put myself up there Point as taken. maybe uh, as <laughs> m- maybe on par. I don't think I troll better than you. Uh, I but like <laughs> you, I refuse. And people are constantly saying, "Oh, you know, you're so childish in the things that you do and you post and you say and the attacks on Trump. He lives in your head." What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use my trolling as a way to get their attention so that they understand Correct. that. There are consequences to their statements. There are consequences to their constant attacks on whether it's Kamala Harris. Now it'll be Tim Walls, Michael Cohen, right, to Rick Wilson. There are constant attacks on everybody by them. And it's when they're a bunch of bullies that like to constantly punch at everybody else. But when you hit back, and like you, when I hit back, I hit back, I go below the belt. They, I'm not they there to play games. It. They're like, they oh, the, the same people that are always like, fuck your feelings, man. The minute right. you get to treat them the same way they treat everybody else, they run for mama. Yeah, well, so, as I, as well, I Michael, always Michael, it's been writing, a pleasure, my brother. Wah, I got to hop. Wah, wah. Let's all call <laughs> the ambulance. Rick, thank you so much, my brother. Great seeing you. Thank and you, my I friend. I'll call you and we'll get you on the show next week. Look forward to it. Thank you, Michael.